Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And since my neck is already a bit uh, stressed, I hope you don't mind if I stand here and uh, I want to show you a couple of pictures and it's easier for me to switch back and forth if I can also see what you see. I will talk about the uh, second largest subcamp of uh, Flossenbürg of the camp complex of uh, Flossenburg concentration camp, uh, which was placed in Hersbruck, um, a place which you will see tomorrow. Um, and I will start with a map. Uh, this map is um, taken from a book by um, a lawyer who was at that time based in Munich, Edward Kosoy. And it's the Handbuch des Entschädigungswesens, a compensation manual, which was published in 1957. It was aimed, or the, the audience for this book, uh, were former forced enslaved laborers who applied for German compensation funding. And many of them, uh, of course, were um, imprisoned in many camps, uh, often for a very short period of time. Uh, which they couldn't remember the names of. And the, these maps, there are a couple of maps included in this book, uh, were aimed to help them to, um, to really prove where they were kept and to find out the right names of the camps. Um, as you can see, um, Central Europe or the German Reich was uh, uh, a country full of concentration camps, not only the, the main camps like Mittelbau Dora or uh, Sachsenhausen, Ravensbrück, Flossenburg, Dachau, but also each of these camps had a, a smaller or bigger um, range of um, subcamps. Like in the case of Dachau, there were 140 subcamps and uh, work details, commandos that spread not only in Bavaria but also in what is today Baden-Württemberg or Austria. And uh, so the, the important effect of this map is to show you that uh, the concentration camp system obviously is not a matter of six or seven places. It's not a matter of Buchenwald and Auschwitz and uh, Dachau, but it's also a matter of Herzbruck and Flöha and uh, Milteuer and whatever names you have never heard of so far. In 1938, the SS ordered the construction of a con concentration camp in Flossenbürg. The SS hoped to exploit the rich granite quarries in Flossenbürg in order to profit from giant and prestigious building projects as the uh, Reich party rally grounds here in Nuremberg. Uh, concentration camp prisoners were considered as cheap labor for this purpose. Soon after the camp was established, inmates also had to work outside of the camp. Especially local farmers and small businesses ordered uh, prisoners mostly for a short period of time, for example, during the harvest and prisoners were guarded on, the, on their way to work and they were brought back to the main camp at night. This was of course a very ineffective, insufficient method uh, where you needed a lot of guard personnel and uh, in the course of the war this uh, system was skipped completely and the SS tried to lend uh, pr um, concentration camp prisoners to private companies or to larger construction projects. In the course of time, uh, a large system of subcamps developed and you can clearly see some regional hotspots, especially in southern Saxony and in northern Bohemia. This is uh, very easy to explain. These were highly industrial regions especially with a lot of consumer industries, textile industry, um, um, food production, etc. Many of these uh, companies were not considered important for the war, uh, for armament uh, purposes, so they were shut down. And companies from uh, cities like Berlin, where there were an increasing danger of air raids, 
uh, were relocated to the rural areas and thus ended up in small towns and uh, villages in, in this area. Herr's book is based here. We are here. You see two spots here, which I will comment uh, in a second. Uh, the concentration camp subcamps in recent uh, research uh, are usually divided up into three categories. Um, first, um, there were subcamps for SS units or SS enterprises, like the SS barracks in Nuremberg, a place which is quite close to where we are right now. Most inmates in these camps were skilled workers like carpenters, welders, locksmiths, etc. And these camps were rather small, about 100 to 200 uh, inmates, most of them Germans or German-speaking prisoners. They were skilled workers, they, which means they were valuable, which means they were treated relatively better than unskilled laborers in the main camp. The uh, second category is um, subcamps for the armament industry. Hannes already mentioned the uh, Serbian women who were brought from Ravensbrück concentration camp to Dresden, uh, where they had to work in an ammunition factory. Uh, in Nuremberg, there was also one subcamp, uh, which Sanella mentioned earlier on in the report of uh, Agnes uh, Rosa. Uh, with uh, 600 Jewish uh, women who had to work for Siemens. Um, these subcamps, in the case of Flossenburg, uh, came into existence um, by the end of 1943. There, were, there was a long struggle between the SS and the private companies and <coughs> Minister Speer. On the other hand, the companies wanted to have an effective kind of uh, uh, forced labor and wanted to have the the workers within their um, within their work uh, grounds, within the places where the, the uh, plants were located, of course, the SS wanted to keep control over these prisoners. So, in the beginning, um, workers for the armaments industry um, were um, expected to work within the concentration camps. Uh, part of a Messerschmitt plant was relocated to Flossenburg. A part of a Heinkel aircraft plant was placed in Sachsenhausen. Uh, but later on, the private companies um, um, kind of won this struggle and were allowed to have uh, separate divisions within their plants where they uh, could use uh, concentration camp inmates for uh, forced labor, both men and women. Um, and the, la the, the third uh, category of subcamps uh, were large scale construction sites which were established only in mid 1944, in the last year of the war, more or less. The Nazi regime wanted to protect the German armament industry from the increasingly successful Allied air raids and therefore it planned the relocation of important production lines to subterranean production sites in tunnels or in huge bunkers. In these construction sites, the most grueling, the most terrible conditions were found. Prisoners were least likely to survive. Uh, this was a place where you needed mostly unskilled labor just for digging, shoveling, very uh, heavy, but uh, not very, uh, um, well, not, not very skilled labor, and so uh, every prisoner was replaceable at any time. The subcamp at Kersbruck was typical of the camps that were established during the final year of the war. Beginning in May 1944, a major construction site was established at the Hoburg Mountain. This is the little village of Hapburg, which is close to uh, Hersbruck, about five kilometers. And here you have the large uh, construction site. And within this mountain, uh, inmates were supposed to dig a huge uh, tunnel system. Large German construction companies like Hochtief, the Siemens Bau Union, and AEG took part in the installation of an underground aircraft engine plant for BMW. 
the BMW aircraft plant from Munich, Alach was uh, supposed to be relocated to this uh, tunnel system. The construction site with the code name B7 included railway lines, building yards, technical facilities, and tunnels. Hapburg, the village where the SS management was headquartered, was also transformed in the process. SS men, including employees and engineers from participating companies, were housed in town. Some buildings served as office space, and the first inmates were also housed in Hapburg. Um, of course, um, the project not only was limited to this mountain, but you needed all kinds of uh, infrastructure. Plans called for a light railway to deliver supplies to the massive construction site at Hapburg. And uh, under the direction of the uh, building company Saga and Werner, um, about 400 uh, prisoners worked laying railroad tracks between the little village of Kommelsbrunn and Hapburg. Saga and Werner, by the way, was also in a consortium with the Siemens Bau Union at Bohr. So these were all old buddies from other places. Uh, the ground was marshy and um, the inmates were often forced to toil in water which was reaching up to their hips. So this labor detail had the highest mortality rate. And of course if I show you this map, there's a little village up here, there's a village up here, there are villages all over the place. Uh, this means this was not a secret system. Of course the public knew and learned about this. In July 1944, the SS established one of the largest subcamps of the Flossenburg concentration camp system on the outskirts of Hersbruck. In August 1944, 1,900 inmates were imprisoned here. You see the, the camp area with the, with the barracks. This is a former barrack of the Reichsarbeitsdienst, which was used as a, a, a commandantur. And you also see the public swimming pool, which was located right next to the camp. So it's, it's that close. Um, prisoners were forced to march five kilometers every day to the construction site at Hapburg. In the evening, they had to march back again, of course. Up to 2,500 prisoners had to work in each shift. There were two shifts, and uh, here you see the part of the tunnel system which is not accessible today. It's too dangerous. The, the geological formation is very shaky and so you cannot enter these tunnels. But you can see some of the former entrances uh, of the tunnel system. Of course, there were not enough SS men to guard the ever-growing number of prisoners. Therefore, Air Force soldiers and ethnic Germans, Volksdeutsche, uh, from southeastern Europe were detailed as guards for the subcamp, not only in Hersbruck but in the entire camp complex. Besides that, some inmates were used by the SS to guard and control their fellow prisoners, as was the usual uh, practice in the camp system. Camp and block elders were supposed to ensure order, while capos guarded labor detachments, worked in the sick bay, and distributed meals. Most prisoner functionaries at Hersbruck were Germans who wore the green triangle of the so-called criminals. As long-time concentration camp prisoners, they possessed great influence and privileges uh, that they exploited to their own advantage. And there, especially for Hersbruck, are a lot of reports about the cruelty of some of these uh, couples. The barracks soon became overcrowded. Arrangements to feed and shelter the prisoners were totally improvised. Living conditions were catastrophic right from the start. Malnutrition, contagious disease, cold, contaminated water, and mud led to a massive increase in the death rate. For the SS, this high mortality rate was an acceptable side effect. As I said, workers were replaceable. At first, the dead were cremated at Nuremberg, at the crematorium. Later, the rapid increase in the number of the dead became a really pressing concern, and in late 1944, the SS ordered the burning of bodies outside, uh, outdoors in the forests uh, near two little villages in the area, Schupf and Hutmersberg. 
In the fall of 1944, the SS ordered the construction of an entirely new camp between Hamburg and Fürnbach. The original plan was to transfer all Hasbrook prisoners to this new camp, but um, this plan was not carried out uh, within the uh, course of the war. However, in January 1945, a crematorium went into operation in this new camp, but it too did not have sufficient capacity. Bodies of the dead continued to be burned outside these little villages. And of course, the smoke was visible for kilometers, and people in the area at least knew roughly what was going on there. Given these circumstances, it is no surprise that some of the prisoners tried to escape these terrible conditions. We know of uh, at least 50 prisoners who tried to escape uh, between May 44 and April 45. Escape attempts were is extremely risky and recaptured prisoners were often uh, executed. So successful escapes were very, very rare. In November 1944, a very special group of prisoners entered the Hasbrook subcamp. On November 9th of 1944, according to the Flossenbürg prisoner number books, as Hannes showed us, uh, more than 2,400 inmates arrived in Flossenbürg, mostly Hungarian Jews. They had started out in Bohr, where the copper mines were dissolved in the fall of 1944. And while hundreds of uh, other prisoners were killed, either in the vicinity of uh, Bohr or on the death marches, these 2,400 uh, 2, men finally arrived in Flossenbürg. And I also have a page from the number books where I have uh, highlighted one entry of Bernhard Teitelbaum, who I will talk about a little later. Uh, besides the prisoners, also the machinery that was used in Bohr was uh, dis distributed and relocated to other camps. There is a, I found a source by the, uh, um, by the uh, organization Todd Südost, uh, which defined where to uh, transport machinery, valuable machinery from Bohr. And um, this document uh, shows a, a couple of uh, addresses. Uh, the, the rail station at Amstetten in Austria, which is close to the Mauthausen camp system. Uh, rail station in Halle an der Saale, which is close to Mittelbau Dora, and the railway station in Hasbrook, which is this one. Um, within a very short period of time, these 2,400 prisoners were distributed to other camps. They did not stay in Flossenbürg, but they were distributed to mainly to camps where there were large construction sites. As I said, Mittelbau Dora, Buchenwald, uh, and a couple of hundred of them ended up in Hasbrook. One of these uh, people was uh, Bernhard Teitelbaum. Um, Anti-Semitic persecution had forced him, he was from Hungary, and uh, persecution had forced him to abandon his university studies in 1941, after which he was drafted into compulsory labor service. In July 1943, he was deported to the Bord copper mine in Serbia, where he labored in tunnel construction and in the demolition squad. After the camp was dissolved, he barely survived the uh, transport to Flossenbürg and finally ended up in Hasbrook. In his memoirs, which he published in 2001 under the title, Though I Walk Through the Valley of the Shadow of Death, he was a very uh, uh, pious uh, Jew, and of course this is a quote from Psalm uh, 23, um, Teitelbaum describes how he was recruited for a certain commando. Quote, the head of the work detail said to me, you were in the ball detachment? I replied, yes. So I was assigned to dig tunnels. So in a certain sense, these were, although it was unskilled labor, these were experts in unskilled labor. So they were detailed to, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, assigned to this work detail. And we also have many reports uh, from um, prisoners who had to work for Siemens Bau Union in Bohr and then had to work for Siemens Bau Union again in Hasbrook. So obviously the companies kept an eye on who was a, a, a good, uh, good laborer. Teitelbaum was uh, forced to work building tunnels at uh, Hasbrook until he fell ill with typhus in the spring of 1945. This is a plan of the huge tunnel system in 
uh, has booked the plan, so a gigantic uh, 200,000 square meters, and of course, like all the gigantic plans of the Nazis, it, it never worked out. And uh, um, so uh, you, uh, the different colors show in which state the, the already finished parts of the system were, and you see the, the color parts are much less than the entire system. These are the tunnels that were like really uh, built out, as I showed you in the picture before. Uh, although BMW had given up this project of an underground factory already by the end of 1944, the SS, who was in charge of this construction site, just kept on working. They didn't know what they were digging for, but they just kept on going. Um, however, by the end of the war, uh, out of 200,000 square meters, 14,000 were uh, finished. That's a, a, com um, a length of uh, four kilometers of tunnels. In February 1945, a huge evacuation transport from the Groß Rosen concentration camp arrived at Hasbrook. More than 6,000 inmates were crowded into the barracks. You saw the aerial picture. Uh, Hasbrook at that time had about, I, I think, nine, eight or 9,000 inhabitants, of course, in a much larger area, and more than almost 7,000 uh, prisoners were cramped into these uh, few barracks. By the time the camp was dissolved in uh, April 1945, the SS had held about um, 9,000 people from more than 20 countries captive at Hasbrook. About 4,000 prisoners died at Hasbrook within 10 months as a result of the ca catastrophic uh, living and work conditions. Most inmates were from Eastern Europe. The largest national groups were uh, Poles, 2,500 Poles, 400 uh, 30 of them Jewish, and more than 1,400 Hungarians, 800 of them Jewish. Of course, Hungarians in terms of Hungary at the time, which includes parts of uh, Croatia, Slovakia, etc., etc. Um, in spring 1945, the SS evacuated all a or most concentration camps. The approaching Allied forces should find no witnesses of the atrocities that were committed in the camps. On April 7th, a train with 1,606 sick inmates left Hasbrook with the destination of Dachau. And Bernhard Teitelbaum was one of them. He arrived at Dachau, he had to go on another death march and was finally liberated somewhere uh, near the Alps, uh, in, almost in Austria. And later he emigrated to Israel and uh, lived till a couple of years ago. Uh, during, um, between uh, April 8th and 13th, almost 4,000 prisoners were marched southwards towards Dachau in five large columns. And during uh, the death march, about 500 were able to escape, about 300 died. And one of the deceased was Gavrilo Kaplarski, who was a trained journalist. He had studied journalism in Paris, had come back to his uh, uh, Serbian hometown. And uh, he was a friend of uh, Lupisha Letic, who we'll hear about soon, and uh, died on the death march in a little uh, village of uh, Schmidmühlen. Other prisoners were liberated by American troops, and on uh, April 23rd, about 2,000 of them reached Dachau. After the end of the war, um, the former camp was um, immediately, pragmatically used for other purposes. Members of the SS were interned in the, the former campgrounds. Later, a refugee, was, uh, a refugee camp was established there. In the beginning of the 1950s, the town of Hasbrook had the barracks torn down. A housing estate was built there on the site on purpose in order to get rid of the traces of this uh, subcamps. It took many years, in fact decades, for the history of the former subcamp to be rediscovered, but that's the topic of the next contribution. Thanks for your attention. Excuse me, can, may I add this shortly? Since I don't know whether you will see this uh, tomorrow, 
um, there are actually two places of the installation that we made a couple of years ago, the, the Flossenbrück Memorial site and the, the Bavarian Memorial uh, Foundation. And you, uh, you will definitely see the one at Hersbruck, uh, but there's also another one at Hapburg, uh, close to the site where the prisoners actually had to work. And uh, I, I don't have a special picture of this, but, but here is a, a long a, a, a drilling device, uh, an, Bohrhammer in German, I don't know the English word for it. And this is one of the uh, machines that uh, Lukisha Letic had to work with. And if you were there, you could start an audio uh, segment where he describes how he had to work there. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>